Welcome to Storytime. Enjoy with me. Woodrow Wilson's Tie by Patricia Highsmith Now for the men. He decided that the man whose neck was cut would look good in the place of the old man who was having dinner. After all, the girl with the long fair hair was pushing a knife into his neck. The figure of the old man was in a sitting position, so Clive put him on the toilet. He looked so funny there, with a knife in one hand and a fork in the other, waiting for something to eat. Clive laughed and laughed. Last, the little man. Clive looked around and noticed the Woodrow Wilson scene. The figure of the president was sitting at a large desk, signing a paper. That was an excellent place, Clive thought, for a man whose head was cut open and bleeding. He managed to take the wax pen out of Wilson's fingers, carry him into the office and put him on the chair at the desk. His arms were in a position for writing, so Clive found a pen on the desk to put into his right hand. Now he could put the little man in Woodrow Wilson's place. He lifted him up onto the chair, but his head fell forward onto the desk, and Clive could not make his hand hold the pen. At last, it was done. Clive smiled. Then he realised that every part of his body was tired. Now that he had the keys, he could get out, go home and sleep well in his own bed. He wanted to be ready to enjoy tomorrow. There was some blood on his coat, so he must throw it away somewhere. But he needed a coat. He took one off a wax figure, which was about his size, and put that on. Then he used the inside of his own coat to clean off any possible fingerprints from places he had touched. He turned off the lights and found his way to the back door. He locked it behind him and dropped the keys on the ground. In the street was a box with some old newspapers, empty cans and plastic bags in it, where he hid the coat. Clive slept very well that night. The next morning, he was standing across the street from the hall when the ticket seller arrived just before 9.30. By 9.35, only three people had gone in, but Clive could not wait any longer, so he crossed the street and bought a ticket. The ticket seller was telling people, Just go in. Everybody is late this morning. He went inside to put on the lights, and Clive followed him. There were four other customers now. They looked at Mildred in her hat and coat, sitting in Marat's bath, without noticing anything strange about her. Two more people came in. At last, by the Woodrow Wilson scene, a woman said to the man with her, Was someone shot when they signed that document at the end of the war? There was blood, real blood, on the papers on the desk. By now, they were dark red. I don't know. I don't think so, the man answered. Clive wanted very much to laugh, but he managed not to. Suddenly, a woman cried out in terror, and at the same time, a man shouted, My God, it's real! Another man was examining the body with its face in the meat and potatoes. The blood's real! It's a dead man! The ticket seller, Fred, came in. What's the trouble? There are two dead bodies here, real ones. Now Fred looked at Marat's bath. Good God! Good God! Mildred! And this one, and this one here. I must call the police, said Fred. 
Could you all, please, just leave? He ran into the office, where the telephone was, and Clive heard him cry out. He had seen Woodrow Wilson at the desk, of course, and Marat. Clive thought it was time to leave, so he did. No one looked at him as he made his way out. That was all right, he thought. That was good. He decided to go to work and to ask for the day off. He told his employer he felt ill and put his hand on his stomach. Old Mr Simmons had to let him go. Clive wanted to take a long bus ride somewhere. He didn't know why he wanted to do this, but the need was very strong. He had brought all his cash with him, about $23, and now he bought a ticket for a bus going west for $7 one way. This took him, by the evening, to a town in Indiana. There was a cafe here where the bus stopped. As he went in, he saw newspapers on sale. There it was, in big letters. Mystery Killer. Three dead in Waxworks Hall. He bought a paper and read it at the bar drinking beer. This morning at 9.30, ticket man Fred Keating and several visitors to Madame Thibault's Waxworks discovered three real dead bodies. They were the bodies of Mrs Mildred Veery, aged 41, George Hartley, 43, and Richard McFadden, 37, all employed at the hall. Police believe the murders happened at about 10 yesterday evening. Because the bodies were put in place of wax figures, police are looking for a killer with a sick mind. Clive laughed over that. <laughs> sick mind? But he was sorry that there were no details about the really amusing things. The old man sitting on the toilet, the man signing the document with his head broken and bleeding. Two men were standing at the bar beside him. Did you read about the murders at the waxworks? He asked one of them. Not really. He didn't seem interested. You see, I did them, said Clive. He pointed to a picture of the bodies. That's my work. Listen, boy, said the man. We're not troubling you, and don't you trouble us. They moved away from Clive. Clive slept in the street that night. On the road the next day, he waved at a passing car, which took him to another town, nearer his hometown. That day's newspapers did not have any more news about the murders. In another cafe that evening, he had a similar conversation, this time with two young men. They didn't believe him either. Next day, he stopped a few more cars and finally reached his hometown. He went straight to the police station. I have something important to say about a murder, he told the policeman, sitting at a desk. He was sent to the office of a police officer who had grey hair and a fat face. Clive told his story. Where do you go to school, Clive? I don't. I'm 18. He told him about his job. Clive, you've got troubles, but they're not the ones you're talking about, said the officer. Clive had to wait in a small room in the police station, and nearly an hour later, a doctor was brought in. Then his mother. They didn't believe him. They said he was just telling this story to attract attention to himself. Clive needs a man around the house, his mother told them. Someone who can teach him how to behave like a man. Since he was 14, he's been asking me questions like, 
Who am I, and am I a person? The policeman told Clive he must see the doctor twice a week for treatment. Clive was very angry. He refused to go back to the supermarket, but found another delivery job. They haven't found the murderer, have they? Clive said to the doctor on one of his visits. You're all stupid, stupid. The doctor only laughed at him. There was one thing which might help to prove his story: Woodrow Wilson's tie, which was still in his cupboard. But he wasn't going to show it to these stupid people. As he delivered things on his bicycle, as he had supper with his mother, he was planning. Next time, he would do something really big. He would take a gun up to the top of a high building, and shoot at the people in the street, kill a hundred people at least. Then they would take notice of him. Then they would realize that he was a person. The end.